You've talked about lightly penciling in a move in December. I wonder how weak would the inflation data need to be this week uh, for you to decide that no rate hike is appropriate? Well, good morning, Adam. Thanks for having me on the show. So I, headline inflation, I don't think we'll see a large move between now and December, but it's really, really the underlying data, the wage data, employment data that I'm looking for. Sorry, you were looking for the inflation. So you don't think the inflation data has the potential, to, this inflation data this week doesn't have the potential to throw the rate hike off course. It's all about the job situation for you. No. Yeah, I think so. Again, we won't see a large move in headline or uh, core inflation, I don't believe. But we may see upticks in w the wage uh, increases and continued tightness in the labor force, which are the really precursors to inflation. And so I think if we see those, I'd be comfortable with the December rate increase. You know, the question is, um, what would make you uncomfortable with a, de with a December rate increase? I mean, if we see core PCE has been so weak uh, and the trend has been right. down this year, if we don't see the wage, the employment support there, um, would you be uh, would you be prone to vote against an increase in December? So if that we saw it tick down again, I would uh, be cautious. But I have to look at all the data, not just, again, the core PCE number. But if we saw that continued weakness, that's why I've said I, we, I penciled it in. If we see that weakness, I'd be OK with waiting a little bit. But I don't expect that right now. So I do expect that uh, I will be supportive of an increase in December. Uh, you've also talked about oh, your I outlook. Sorry, Matt, go ahead. Well, I, I was just wondering about the, the yield curve um, flattening. And at least um, fr from our view, it's pretty dramatic. Um, we haven't seen a yield curve this flat in over a decade. And it seems that the Fed continues to push up the short end with the long end trading flat. Why is the long end picking up mm -hmm. uh, at the same time? Well, I think there are a lot of uh, likely suspects there. One is just simply that other banks, the European Central Bank, Bank of Japan, others, continue to be highly accommodative. And that is one of the reasons we're seeing the long end flatten out. I am concerned about that, and that's why the pace of removal of accommodation, to me, has to be gradual. So the pace has to be gradual. If it is gradual, do you think we will not see any inversion of the curve? Well, I would like to avoid any inversion of the curve. So... My goal is to remove accommodation in a way that we do not run the risk of inverting the yield curve. Does it, does it concern you to see the yield curve this flat? I mean, typically, that's a sign that the economy is slowing down. This, uh, this expansion has grown pretty long in the tooth. Well, we are starting to see really tight labor markets. We're seeing unemployment at 4.1 percent. Our forecast is that we'll dip slightly below 4 percent before coming back up. So we are seeing a lot of tightness uh, in labor markets. We're seeing a lot of other growth uh, limitations in the economy. But that said, this expansion has been quite remarkable for how long it's gone on and the continued steady pace of job growth in the U.S. It's been remarkable for those reasons. It's also possibly been remarkable for what we've also seen in the stock market during this expansion period. Um, as the balance sheet of the Fed and other central banks has increased, we've seen stocks go up. Are you confident that we won't see that correlation maintained as your balance sheet shrinks? So are you confident we avoid triggering a sell-off in equities? Well, at least for our balance sheet renormalization, that's the speech I gave here in Tokyo. We are trying to do this in a way that is as boring as watching paint dry. We want to make this slow, steady on autopilot and, and put that on autopilot and then use changes in the Fed funds rate as the control variables, the thing that we will either increase or decrease. But I don't see us uh, playing with how we're doing the balance sheet renormalization. We want to keep that easy, just easy, clear, concise, and communicate very clearly what we're doing. Patrick, markets seem to be taking it quite well. I mean, uh, markets are penciling in even more than lightly a rate rise in December. Um, and you've got a projection of three hikes in 2018. Mm -hmm. Plus, even if it's boring, you're still unwinding the balance sheet. It's unchartered territory. Right. Um, are, are you right. surprised with how well markets are dealing with this? 
Well, I think markets were anticipating it far in advance of our uh, our statement in the last meeting, and that's a good thing. I mean, think our, part of our job is to communicate very clearly to, to the markets what we atten- intend to do, and then execute on that. Uh, Patrick, you say you want things to be well, gradual, kind of- predictable, and boring. Is there anything you see, though, in markets in terms of positioning that does worry you? We've talked about positioning in junk bonds, talked about those who are betting on low volatility. Do, do those kind of positions, as the balance sheet unwinds at the Fed, do they worry you? No, not at this point, no. What, 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 what would you uh, see as an ideal terminal rate, Patrick? I mean, with three increases this year, that puts you at, uh, I think, 225 on the upper bound. Does that um, seem too far away to you? Yeah, so we're, we're heading toward, in the forecast horizon, a Fed funds rate of around 3% uh, or so. That's our forecast. But again, we'll take our time to get there and we'll do it in a very prudent fashion so that we don't disrupt the markets and we run no risk of inverting the yield curve.